July of 1967, 12 unlikely companions set off on an adventure of a lifetime to climb North America's largest mountain, Mount Denali. What started off as a dream climb for the group soon turned into an arctic nightmare which saw seven of the men lose their lives in one of America's deadliest ever mountaineering tragedies. This is the infamous story of the Mount Denali disaster. Our story begins in 1967, which saw Brigham Young University graduate Joe Wilcox come up with a plan to climb Mount Denali. He sent out a letter asking for climbers to join him on his trip. The trip would charge $300 per person to cover food, equipment and transportation from Seattle to Alaska. Mount Denali is in Alaska and is the highest mountain in Northern America with a summit elevation 21,310 feet. Denali is notoriously difficult to climb and the climate can change from clear skies to a whiteout in a matter of minutes. Joe did know the dangers however as four people had perished on the mountain already. His letter proved popular and eight men from around the country signed on. These include Ansel Schwiff, Jerry Clark, Steve Taylor, Dennis Lutcherhand, Henry James, Mark McLaughlin, Walt Taylor, and John Russell. After this, he applied to Mount McKinley National Park for permission to make the climb. Rangers were skeptical about the application due to the experience of the climbers, but eventually agreed to let them climb. A second group of four men from Colorado, consisting of Paul Slickler, Howard Snyder, Jerry Lewis, and his brother Steve, had also planned to climb the mountain on the same day. On the way up, however, Steve had a car accident and broke his arm and nose, reducing the group number to three. This was one man short of the minimum requirement to climb Mount Denali, so rangers suggested that the groups merge and climb the mountain together at the last minute. Both parties agreed and their 12-man group was named the Wilcox Expedition after Joe Wilcox. They were instructed to both carry radios so that they could communicate with each other on their climb. They met up that morning on the 22nd of June, 1967, and set off on their harrowing journey, unbeknown of the horror that was coming their way. The men's age ranged from 24 to 31. According to reports, the group were not friendly with each other. They often clashed heads and at times even refused to talk to each other. The expedition strategy called for ascending the mountain more than once, bringing supplies to one camp, then going back to the first camp, lower down the mountain, and bringing up more supplies. This was to become acclimatised to the altitude easier, and so they weren't carrying all their equipment at once, as this would have made the journey a lot harder. The journey started off fine, but a few days in, they were met with a rain shower which soaked their clothes and sleeping bags. The group would argue over the gear they carried and left some equipment behind, including a stove, shovel and a saw, to lighten the load. Things went from bad to worse when an avalanche unexpectedly hit the group, blocking off their route. They did however all overcome this, and although most of the men had altitude sickness for the majority of the journey, none of them gave up. By July the 14th, they were approaching the summit. At this point they were split into two camps. One camp was higher up the mountain at 17,999 feet. These were the Colorado climbers Snyder, Slickler, Jerry and also Joe Wilcox. For the ease of the story we will now call this group one. At 15,000 feet was the other camp and these were the eight unexperienced climbers. We will call this group two. The weather was clear and both groups agreed on the radio that if they were going to make it to the summit, they had to do it over the next two days. On the morning of July the 15th, Group 1 decided to head up to the summit whilst Group 2 made it to their camp. Group 1 reached the summit and celebrated by taking pictures and letting off a flare. They then left the summit and returned to the camp at 17,999 feet where they met the others who were preparing to make their summit journey the next day. The next day at 1pm, Group 1 headed back down to the camp at 15,000 feet. 
Ansel Schiff also went down with them as he didn't believe that he could make it to the summit due to altitude sickness. They expected Group 2 to set off at the same time, but this wasn't the case. The group set off at 3pm, wasting time searching for fuel bottles that had been buried in the snow. Only six of them went up, however, as a further one stayed back at the camp as he was throwing up. Nobody heard from the group until 8.30pm when they radioed the rangers at Eelson Visitor Centre where they reported back that they didn't know where they were due to the fog. The weather had taken a turn for the worse, making it hard for the group to see. Because of this, the group decided to stay where they were until morning. They didn't hear back from the men until the 18th of July at 11.30 when the group again radioed the rangers claiming that five of them had made it to the summit and were planning to head down. They also claimed that they were in whiteout conditions, the wind was howling and they couldn't see in front of them. They ended the call saying that they would radio again at 8 that night, but that call never came. That night on July the 18th, as the group headed down from the summit, Mount Denali was hit with one of the worst storms ever recorded, with winds of up to 300 miles an hour. The storm also had hit Group 1 as they made their way down the mountain. By July the 20th, they knew that the others were in danger because they hadn't heard back from them, so they decided to climb back up the mountain and search for their missing teammates. This search was abruptly stopped when the snow blocked their route and they couldn't go any further. The group of five were eventually saved by John Babcock and his team of experienced mountaineers who were also climbing the mountain at the same time. Babcock and his men gave the group food and water and helped them reach base camp by the 25th of July. At this point, Group 2 hadn't been heard of for a week. By now, all seven of the members were dead. No one knows for sure what happened as Group 2 ascended, but there is no doubt some of them were blown off the mountain. Babcock's team had the job of searching for the missing men but only three bodies were ever found. By the time they were found, it was impossible to tell who they belonged to as they were completely frozen. There was also no way of getting them off the mountain, so they remain there to this day. Snyder from Group 1 stated, in weather conditions like that, backpacks blow away and the wind rips gloves off hands. Trying to navigate down the peak in those conditions would have been impossible. Slichter went on to say, I think they may have started down and reached a point where they said, it's every man for themselves. It is likely that we will never know exactly what happened to the men, but it is pretty obvious. The men got caught up in the storm and their fate was sealed. They then suffered a miserable and cold death. The three bodies were found when Babcock made his way to their camp at 17,999 feet. Two of the bodies were found in the snow the other was found with a tent wrapped around his body and he was holding onto the pole. The victims include Jerry Clark, Steve Taylor, Dennis Lutcherhand, Henry James, Mark McLaughlin, Walt Taylor and John Russell. In the aftermath, many blame Joe Wilcox for being unqualified and having poor leadership skills by summiting the mountain without the unexperienced climbers. Wilcox also blamed himself but Snyder and Slitler now have different opinions. They said, the tragedy was caused by those guys not taking advantage of the good weather, first on our summit day, then on their summit day, and mainly the weather. It doesn't matter how strong, how experienced, or how cautious you are. If you get caught in the circumstances they were, that's going to be the result. He also believed that the outcome was probably inevitable. Nothing anybody could have done would have made a difference. To this day, the Mount Denali disaster remains one of the most infamous and deadliest in American history. <laughs>